Hi again. Okay. I'm currently in a hotel room in Pennsylvania. I'm in uh, Philadelphia. As soon as I figured out that I was completely screwed for getting over there, I drowned my sorrows by heading towards the Liberty Bell. I should. I discovered the hard way that it takes an hour and a half to go two blocks in New York City in a car when you're heading towards the Holland Tunnel because the Holland Tunnel was down to one lane. So by the time I got to the airport, I was just outside the realm of where they would let me on the plane. When we tried to move me so that I could come and we'd do a later showing, they informed me that it would cost $3,500 to shift my ticket. I decided that wasn't worth it. For that price, you can buy everyone a beer in the room. So. I, uh, I just said, okay, well, let's just transfer this over to you. Okay. So that's yes. Will be the day of long distance communication for no money at all. So like like free long distance communication. I cannot see the world uh, uh, revolution uh, even though there is Skype and we have you here f uh, directly from Pennsylvania. But, I mean, you're a historian. I think, I, I think people have this weird idea of what revolution is. You know, revolution is when people as a whole start to think of something wonderful as an expectation and begin building on it. And to have it gone would change their lives radically. So if people lost mobile phones right now, we'd be in a heck of a mess. Same thing with a lot of other stuff. So the fact that you no longer think, it's not a case of, we've never had a technology where once it's here, everyone just kind of stops, unless you count television. But even then we got into how can we make television better? How can we do that stuff better? So I, you know, I think it's a case of, yes, we do have a revolution underway. It's much harder to claim now that something is a certain way in parts of the country because you can just call them up and video chat and ask them what's up. So, um, you know, for instance, um, it was known that during the Iranian Revolution crackdown, the, um, the protest crackdown, people were using their Xbox Live consoles to chat with people in Iran. I mean, um, yeah, in Iran, because they didn't think to go after Xbox Live. So there you had an uncensored communication going through gaming consoles. So, you know, I think this is a little heavy for a documentary about games, though. Yeah, uh, it, it is a little bit, yeah, yeah. But still, I mean, most games actually deal with death and destruction and whatever. I mean, good. Uh, your, your, your job is like you're a digital historian, one of the few people out there who's really interested in the history of the digital age, like going back the last 30, 40 years, what was happening. Uh, your last big documentary was like over five hours in length, and you yes. dealt uh, with uh, the BBS uh, systems. Could you do like a small summary of uh, what, why you did the BBS documentary? Because I think it's interesting uh, to start with that before we talk about your new project. Okay, the reason I did the BBS documentary was that I had started a site called textfiles.com the reason I started that was because textfiles.com came at a time when I looked around for information on BBSs online, and there really wasn't a lot. Um, you know, there really wasn't a lot of collected data. I figured I'd be able to go back and get lists of all the old BBSs, and I'd be able to read some of the old files, and there was nothing. And I said, okay, well, let me start something. So I put all of my, my own collection, which was large, up on textfiles.com. 
And around 2000, after I'd gotten a little bit of, I don't know, fame, some sort of reputation for that, it occurred to me that nobody had done a documentary on bulletin board systems. I had been waiting for that. That hadn't happened. And I was really concerned that a lot of these guys were going to die. And I think that there's not really anything that can compare to going back to the guy or the gal who did something and saying, why this, why this, why this, and getting their answers. You'll get muddled by time, and yes, yeah, some of them lie, but it's good to see them lie. I mean, it's good to like get, like, what was the personality of the person who did this? And so that's why I started it. Unfortunately, I'm really obsessive-compulsive. So I did 205 interviews, and it took four years, and the final work was five and a half hours and eight episodes, three DVDs, and um, it was like... I was worried there weren't going to be any BBS documentaries, and now there's too much. Um, although I do get people who, I do get people who tell me, you know, man, I wish this thing was longer, which which just kills me. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so after I'd finished BBS and it was a success and it was out there and people like it, um, I thought, what else affected my childhood? And the two biggest answers were text adventure games and arcades. So I decided to go after text adventures, and it was a whole other animal and a whole different way of doing things. And here we are about four years later, and I'm about to finish it. That means uh, the version that, you will be, that we will be screening today uh, in your absence is, it's almost like, a, it's almost like, a, like an hour-long hour -long trailer of some kind, as I see. Yes, that's what I call it, the hour-long trailer. The actual film is something like two and something hours and is interactive. It branches in different directions, um, depending on which way you wanted to go in the story. And this is a version that I say is for people who both care and don't care about the subject. Um, if you were to show this to somebody who had never played them, they'd go like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, look at that. That's cool. All right. And if you're somebody who's into it, you go, wow, there's that and there's that and so on, but if it's two and a half hours, um, you start to go, oh my God, why are we still here? Um, and so it's, it's a version that I think gets the story across, and it's, um, I mean, it's, it's an edited film, um, it's just that it goes in a different direction than parts of the movie. Yeah. And so the movie's coming out on a, a DVD, I guess I'll mention that now in case people jump out before whatever, so... Um, this is the packaging for the DVD, um, which is, as usual, I like to go crazy about packaging, so this one actually turns into a full, um, whoa, let me get that right. There you go. So it's got a, it's got a um, painting that I had done with lots of adventure oh. stuff on it. What the fuck? There's some fuck up here, like, one second, one second. You got it, buddy. Hi, Jens. Oh. Did a virus bubble come up? I heard people giggling. Yes, yes. It was spam. Yeah. Oh, even better. Yeah. So anyway, so that's all. So this, here's the other side. Um, it's not as easy to make out. Um, right here I have a picture of where the actual maze of twisty little passages begins and so on. And finally, because I thought, well, you have to reward people for buying the physical product these days. Um, and this is going to be impossible to portray on here, but it's going to be out of focus, I'm sorry. But I had a coin minted. Um, so there's a GitLab coin. And on the other side, it's got an individual number, and it's made of gold and silver. And so when you buy one, you get an individually numbered coin. Got to do something, right? Yeah, but... but it but, but it's interesting because nowadays, if, you, if you're a movie maker, if, you're, uh, if you make documentaries, you almost certainly, especially if it's about a topic like, like uh, you portray and that's very relevant for nerds, you, the stuff ends up on Pirate Bay, like probably like two months or like two days after you, you publish it. So is there like a certain, or maybe two seconds, yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> But it might not take two seconds to upload it, so maybe longer. So it is, uh, it, there's it a certain more, interest in like authenticity, I guess, and that's what the coin, I guess, represents. It's very difficult to torrent a coin yet. Um, 
and the packaging is unique. Um, the, the, the big problem, I think, is that um, the Hollywood version of movie making is to push the product as fast as possible to the widest amount of people so that you'll make the most money quickly enough before people realize it sucks. Um, occasionally somebody hoodwinks them and makes a really good movie through that system, but the key is just to push it everywhere. And I like to think that a movie like this appeals very strongly to a very specific set of people who will absolutely love it. And they're not going to be many. They're going to be in the tens of thousands as opposed to the millions. And that's fine. And for those people, they know that there's one guy behind it, and they're going to see the movie, and they're going to buy the product knowing that it helps me. This is the only way now that I am making money. As of last September, I am doing this full time. And so... Wasn't there this story that you actually invited people to donate money to you and the project? For, to, because uh, people kind of realized that you quit your job to do what you're doing full time, like A, doing a get lamp, and B, doing all your uh, work as a historian that takes hours and hours and hours per day. So is there actually a c community out there supporting you financially? Um, there was a fundraiser that I started last year that said, um, if you believe in me, invest in me, and I will produce as much stuff as possible as long as I can and use it as a way to change my lifestyle so that I am primarily doing history. And that got $25,000. Um, and I'm living off of that. Um, I've pulled in a bunch of favors and um, I don't live in the same place I used to and I'm paying a lot less for what I'm doing and I don't go out to dinner as much. Um, so I'm just trying to do that. And this, this film is basically the only way that I'm going to make money this year, really. So it's, it's, that's my plea to anybody who wants to pirate it initially. But the film is Creative Commons. So the instant it's out there, people can duplicate it. That's part of the license. I mean, it's Creative Commons licensed. I didn't want to be uh, acting like copyright was working for me because it doesn't. I've written a very long essays about that. Um, it's an unusual move to me to have transferred an MP4 to you guys to play, but I really felt bad about not making it. And I love you, Johannes. Oh, I so, but, but I just wanted, you know, anyway, so that's what that is. Um, but yeah, I mean, it'll get duplicated and people who don't care as much about the subject will kind of download it and watch it and be like, oh, that was pretty good and move on to the next thing. But there's people who believe in what I'm doing and want me to do more, and that will help me do it. My hope is to buy a, DL, a DSLR and do one in arcades. Uh, we'll see how that goes, and so on. So anyway, okay. um, I don't want to kill people. And as you said, I talk more than you do about anything. And they yeah. came here to see a movie. So yeah, yeah. why don't we watch so, the movie, and then we can take questions and answers yeah. afterwards. I'm just asking uh, if there are any questions before the movie right now, mm. because I know people, uh, because there is some, you know, you are, your conflict, there's, there's a conflict going on here, because a lot of the people I know will head out to go to the party just like exactly. a couple of minutes before your movie will be over. So in case anyone already knows that he will not or she will not see the whole movie, any questions for Jason right now? No? Okay. <laughs> It means that they are planning to stay here, I hope. And I know your faces, yeah. Oh, there's a question. Yep, please. Where? Where is there? It's dark. I don't see you. Um, is there a version of the DVD without the coin? Because you said it's made out of gold and silver, and so it's probably really expensive. <laughs> Did you hear it? No. No, of course no. not. No, okay. So uh, the question was, is there a version of the DVD box without the coin? Because uh, our listener uh, seems to believe it's made out of real gold or something and might be expensive. <laughs> no. No. There's absolutely no difference. But the price, here's the deal. Here's what I did. I, I, I was proud of this, actually. Um, I have all these people who believe in what I do, and they knew I was working on this project. So what I announced in December of last year was, I'm going to tell you nothing about what the project is going to be. And 
um, I'm going to sell it to you for 25% less than what I charge. And I gave no details. All you knew was going to be a movie about text adventures. And a good portion of people bought copies. A couple hundred people bought copies with no information. And so they had no idea they were going to get a free coin with it. And they had no idea what was going to come on it. And over time, it's turned out to be a pretty good deal. It's still, I like to think, a pretty good deal. Um, but the coin is not affecting the price. I didn't have a certain price then do a coin and then raise the price. Um, so it's, it's to me, the, the price helps me pay for all the production time. I, I did about uh, 85 interviews, um, traveled around the country, got a bunch of people, worked on it for a few years. So now 40 bucks is 40 bucks. Um, now, I had somebody from Germany who wanted to buy a bulk of it and sell it locally in Germany. So I'm open to those kind of discussions, and then they can possibly pass the savings on to you and da, 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 so on. I mean, that's fine. I'll, I'll certainly talk to people about that. Um, but the coin, I think the coin is important. I think that you should experience the coin, as it were. Yeah. And it's not real gold, I guess, or something. It is plated in, in, gold, in gold and silver. What? Real? <laughs> real? Okay, whatever. <laughs> okay. I mean... So forty dollars is the price. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Yeah. There's one. Why there isn't a lamp? What? One more time. Why there isn't a lamp in there? Why not? Uh, yeah. Is is there a lamp with it too? <laughs> I thought about that. Um, You're crazy. Well, you know what? The, what the heck? Um, I you know I thought about what I was looking at originally was you get a little tiny lamp with it. And then I thought, you know, that's really stupid. Um, the coin turns out to be pretty good. I'm, I mean, I thought about like, oh, a deluxe pack. You get something and something, and then you get an actual lamp. And I suppose I could sell one of those, but it would be stupid. Um, it'd be cute. I guess in some way it'd be to support me. But, man, you know, I, I like to make every package the deluxe package. Um, I'm not really big on like, okay, and now here's a completely ludicrous package for five of you. So, you know, I, so no, I, I didn't, I, I was thinking, but everything I do with this thing, I think through, and I don't throw every idea out, but the lamp thing just seemed to make no sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe one more question. Is there one? The diamond. Okay. So if there is n okay, so then the last question is from oh there is no okay then uh, uh, one last question uh, bef because even I don't know the film so it's I, it's a complete surprise for me too, but one question it's uh, more like a melancholic or nostalgic question, so what moment like in making the film, uh, do you think you will still remember like in 25 years? So what was like the most precious moment you experienced while doing the documentary? Oh, pr precious moment. Um, like not, not in a monetary way, like, you know, just like. <laughs> there, is, there is a point, there's a, without giving it away, there's a point in the film when you see something very special to people who are into adventures. It's a, pl it's a, it's a place. And when I was there, I was like, wow, I, you know, I, it took me a year to get there, a year of work. And I, when I got there, I was like, all right. And I will live with that forever. And I can discuss that in detail afterwards. Um, so, you know, that, that was the idea. Um, just, oh, just for my own edification, um, Johannes, how many people are in attendance? Uh, we'll, we'll let, I would say, what? <laughs> just one. Like... Uh... Like sand coin, uh, s s like like what do you say? Like Sandkörner am Meer. Uh, <laughs> now it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eleven, 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 eleven. It's it's. I I would guess around forty or something. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. I mean, I'm up against Kaminsky. You know how many times I've been up in Kaminsky in the last ten years? It'll be like, oh, you're 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 speaking. Oh, look, Dan Kaminsky's in the other room. 
I had one case in one place. I had this. I, I gave a presentation to six people. Oh well, no, it's 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 exactly forty four plus two technicians who don't count. <laughs> oh, don't count. And and a, and a quick shout out to um, um, Adventures If. I, I'm getting that I'm getting that wrong, aren't I? Who am I getting wrong? Adventure Treff. Adventure Treff, yeah. yeah. There's someone screaming, Adventure Treff, yeah, yeah, Adventure Treff. Ah, oh, yes, 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 crazy Germans, I, yeah. I knew those guys were really, I mean, there were a few people who made a lot of, wanted to really go to this and made a lot of effort to come out to see this specifically. And they were part of the reason I went completely against my nature and released this MP4 <laughs> in the hands of people so that it could be shown to them. Yeah. Just so you know. Yeah. So we, we all are... Like uh, there, there's an ever-growing hate towards the Holland Tunnel that kept you from coming to to Germany, but maybe uh, in the future, uh, like a different chaos communication congress or whatever, maybe we'll be able to fly you over. Uh, so there will be question and answers like later on after the film. But now I would yeah. say we'll start with the presentation, the feature presentation. I guess. Okay. See you in a bit. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Wir machen einfach umstöpseln. Okay. There is a There is a machine that you must operate, but you have to figure out what machine it is, what its function is, what it does, uh, why you need to operate it. You have to figure out what that thing is. What is an adventure game and what makes it so uh, interesting for people? It's a, in a world right now where we're going to graphics a lot, it seems to be basic, based in words. You interact with the computer in words and the computer spits words back out at you. And 
so there are no pictures at all except the ones in your head, which are the mm -hmm. best. Now, uh, uh, these are the kind of games that, uh, well, mostly, I guess, kids play with, and, and they, they go through a, a different branching uh, schemes, and every, every point you get a chance to go north, south, east, and west, and so forth. So are, these, are these games getting more sophisticated now? Who's writing them? Are they being written by authors? Or what? They're definitely getting more sophisticated, and I wouldn't even say that they're mostly played by children mm -hmm. anymore. You can talk to other characters. You can ask fairly complicated questions, like, uh, where were you on the night of the murder? The thing that really interests me about text adventures is that they explore the power of words in an interactive context. You're looking at a story told through text on a computer. It's a virtual reality that uh, exists in words. Interactive digital rhetoric that describes an experience. It, it really was more like playing a book than playing a game. I say to them, here's a form of literature you may or may not have seen before. Typically what I end up having to do uh, is I fumble around and, and talk about it for a little while and then I say, here, sit down for a second, let me show you something, and then demonstrate it to them. For me, this adventure has gone on for a lifetime. It's working on a problem that's bigger than you are. It's one you can't solve in five minutes or ten minutes. I started caving in the late 60s and then got involved in organized caving in the late 70s. I definitely had been caving and surveying caves before I latched on to the idea that there was this game out there that was so closely related to, to the caves and, and, uh, and described them in a, in a manner that uh, uh, would appeal to a caver. Well, I knew Will White before the game existed, and I do know that uh, my son, uh, Tom Brucker, spent uh, uh, several weeks down here with uh, Will Crowther and his wife at the time. They, they were intensely looking at a cave called Bed Quilt Cave, a very confusing part of the cave. We have something like 10 lineal miles of cave within one square mile of land. Bed Quilt is one of the highest density of cave passages that you find anywhere in the whole cave system. We're fascinated with, with how uh, tightly twisted and three-dimensional Bed Quilt Cave turned out to be. And it was uh, even more tightly twisted than uh, appears to the casual person just passing through it. It's just really fun to to discover in Bedco Caves these places where you can squeeze up through something and end up somewhere else. <laughs> it's just filled with places like that. So. That, I know, is the origin of the game Adventure that Will subsequently uh, invented. The walls really started tumbling down for me and I really started learning a lot more when I started shifting going into um, the Cave Research Foundation, learning what I learned about it, um, reading you know, Rucker and Watson's The Longest Cave. They would use their compass readings and their bearings. They would start from a known position and they would, they would take the distance and bearing and measure from one place to another. Along the whole process, they would be taking notes about the shape of the tunnels, the, the shape of the size, features in the tunnel. They'd be mapping while they were going. So there was a sort of a, a I don't call it decorative, but the artistic, uh, atmospheric recording, along with the scientific coding of exactly where something is in relation to something else and what you need to do to get from one place to the other. I think if they were able to compare our maps and the game, on one level it would be completely dissimilar, but on another there's a certain similarity. Uh, the general directions, east, west, north, south, up, down, all hold generally true. 
as you go through the part that Crowther wrote. I know others have uh, added little touches to it now and then, but the genius was his in working out a diagram of the passageways in the bed quote. I don't think it was really promoted as a as a caver's game, although I was really proud that Will he could have made adventure go any direction it wanted to, but to sit there and I mean, what better way to take a real cave and have real north, south, east, west, up, down directions that, that actually were based in reality. But one of his daughters said to me that to her, Will Crowther is just her dad, and it's surprising to her that he's the J.D. Salinger of interactive fiction. He's chosen to, to, to make it speak for himself. and. Um, he hasn't tried to um, leverage it or anything, so uh, I just, you, you got to respect somebody like that. So I was at Stanford my first year as a grad student there. Um, one of the other first year grad students um, had a job at the uh, Stanford Medical Center, um, that was John Gilbert, and he came across this program that had somehow migrated onto the computer there. I managed to get a copy of it from that system onto the Stanford AI Lab machine where I had an account. I began having lots of ideas for ways to modify it and make it a, you know, either more cohesive or just have more stuff to do in it. But in terms of the the layout of the cave, the items you could find, the goals you had, um, I kept all of that. I, I didn't realize at the time that this was going to be starting in a, a new genre. Um, and I sort of realized it was unlike anything I had encountered up to that point. And so, you know, maybe subconsciously, I, I, if anybody had asked, I would have realized, yeah, this is something new. But still, I wouldn't have guessed that it was going to catch on so much. I was, it was 1979, and a friend of mine had just come back from Sierra College going nuts, saying, oh my god, there's games up at the college and they're free. <laughs> Everybody was talking about it uh, for a period there in 1978. It, uh, it came out of nowhere and it got copied all over the place. In our dorm, there was a computer room which had two old deck line printer terminals. And they said, there's this game you've got to try out. It's called Adventure. It's really great. And they had all these incredibly cool Lisp machines with big gorgeous displays and a bunch of people are huddled around a machine that's got text. Yeah, you'd sit there with a little 300 baud telephone modem and type in a line, you know, get lamp and wait a minute, two minutes, and then you know, they would type the thing out. So. Adventure took us over, took the whole lab over, consumed everyone for a while. The, the game by Crowther and Woods was, uh, was a sensation. Uh, I had to sign in as JQ Public, and the password was JQ Public, and everybody was playing it. And then nobody got any work done for a week. As the, the legend goes, and it's absolutely true, all productivity ceased for about a week as people attempted to solve it. You know, that's something that in the 70s, to be able to type commands to a computer in something that looked like English, and to have it respond to you with lines of text telling you what happens next, that um, captivated people. We got down to the point finally where Bruce went in with a binary debugger to get the last couple of points. I was working at Stromberg Carlson, just outside of Orlando, and they had a deck mainframe there. And one of the um, guys in the IT department said, hey, we got a really neat game on the, the mainframe that uh, we've been playing, and you, you might want to take a look at it. And it was Colossal Caves. So I got permission or to have to get onto the game. I would come in every morning before work for an hour or two, and then I would stay for 
an hour after work so I could play the game. And I played it for about a week and I was just blown away by it. It was a lot of fun. This was about the same time that I had gotten my first appliance computer. To me, an appliance computer was one I didn't have to build from a kit, which was kind of unique. And it was a TRS-80 Model 1. This adventure game was really fun. I've been trying to think of a good game to write. Adventure seemed, wow, this is perfect. Um, the fellows in the IT department uh, said, uh, well, you want to take a look at the source code for this game? I said, no, I'm, I'm not really interested in that. I, I just like the concept. Um, they said, well, this thing runs on the mainframe. There's no way you're going to get it into a 16K TRS-80 Model 1. And uh, that was Adventureland. This was back in 1978, and that's where it all started. Adventure International made adventure games. Literally, we were the first, as far as I know in the world, first computer gaming company that was selling computer games primarily. That was it. That was what we were doing. We were selling computer games and we were doing it to a mass market. It just came up uh, last night. I was watching a movie from the early 80s because we thought maybe the kids would enjoy that. And my wife was telling the girls, you know, what time this was. This was a long time ago. It was before we were married. It was when Daddy was doing Zork and those things. And, uh, and my seven-year-old said, what's Zork? I think uh, there, were, there were two products that sold more computers than anything else. There's a calc and Zork. We would go after school to this store and play whatever games were available, type games in, and I remember Zork coming out and, and playing it on an Apple II and we were just completely blown away. People would see Zork and they'd go, I gotta have me one of them. That's all. Who do I make the check out to? You know, someone who helped on Adventure um, played a little bit of Zork and, and his, his comment was that you, know, you don't go into Zork to play, you go into Zork to do battle. <laughs> I actually completed Zork and that was probably in itself like the biggest accomplishment I made, you know. And the company was literally founded and named before we had any idea what kind of products we were doing. <laughs> so by definition, you want a name that can pretty much go anywhere. So Infocom sounded like it could be a billion dollar company. You had no idea what it did, but it sounds substantial. The people who formed Infocom, these were very talented folks from the computer science department at MIT. If you know what the word schlump means, I don't think there were any at the, at the company. There were, there were no average people there. If you had some technical knowledge and some understanding of what the disk capacity was and you cared to count characters, you wondered how is it possible that they got so much text on a disk? You know, they were sort of things to waste my time, uh, fun little diversions, and then I hit Infocom, so I'm like, wow, this is really, really good. Very professionally done, so I knew that every time an, uh, an Infocom game came out, it was going to be extremely high quality. You know, it's 
it, it was really kind of the renaissance for as far as game packaging design because they put out some really gorgeous looking packages that really we have not seen anything like since then. Keep in mind, these were not collector's editions. These were the standard versions of the packaging. You know, all the other games were kind of crappy packaged and everything, but there on the shelf was this one game, which was like in a dossier with this detective thing going on. It was Deadline, and I saw that, and I found out it was like a tech, not only a text picture, but a really advanced text picture. I saw that, I said, oh, this is it. I gotta do this. I think I felt lucky at the time. Um, I definitely, you know, uh, looking back now, 20 years later, you know, feel really, really lucky. <laughs> when you were a programmer, you wrote payroll packages. I mean, you, you know, you wrote software for scientific instruments. I was working on a uh, fertilizer mixing system in BASIC. You know, something like that, or, or, you, or you did some kind of research, but this idea that you could somehow make a living doing what we were doing, you know, the, the, the fun we were having making games and everything, it's ridiculous. It's a job that, that didn't exist when I first started my working life, and in a sense it doesn't exist anymore now. Talking about how wonderful it was, and it, it really was, I mean, I, I can say, for me it was a sad truth that it was the best job I've ever had, and, and a job I don't think I could ever get again. I remember telling friends that if I could have any job at all, I think it would be this one. It was a fun factory, you know, and they put in the Play-Doh and they, we pressed the button and out come all these interesting things, but they didn't know how that process worked at all. N not a job, it was a, an amazing creative experience with an amazing creative group, and I do think it was something very special and unusual. You would hear conversations there at Infocom and other game companies that you never hear, would hear anywhere else in your life. One day we were talking about the properties of Bakwano, and in the middle of it we stopped and said, no one's going to believe we actually discussed this at work. You know, so you're walking down the hall, and out of somebody's office is going, well, you know, the elf is drunk, but I've given him the wand of disappearing. And we called it interactive fiction, not text adventures. Um, and, you know, part of that is being a little bit grand about the medium and its possibilities, but part of it was, I think it was a more accurate term. I think there was a, a time period, probably 80 to 84 sort of range, where for a lot of the machines, compared to anything else out there, there was just nothing that compared. We would have three or four uh, games in the top 20 of soft sell all the time in 83, 84, 85. Uh, we, were, we were definitely one of the, the more important publishers and possibly one of the most respected. <laughs> all the other games uh, companies back then that had adventure games, those came from the Texas Adventure era. So, you know, a lot of people owe, owe everything to, to Texas Adventures. When I started, the goal was to push the envelope. The goal was to create something different, new, and exciting, something nobody had ever seen or experienced before. We, we were able to compress things in, in ways that delivered so much more than anything else. You felt like you were, you were joining a, 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 like a special brainy club by buying these products. And you know, I, I put my Star Cross poster up on the wall and sat there with all my accessories around me and I was happy as a clam. People were wowed by it when they saw those games, when they, when they found how much they got, how, much, how many hours of entertainment they got out of those games. The, the, the whole feel of it, uh, the marketing and everything, I just have this very friendly smart people feel about it. I don't know how to put it without sounding snobby, but it just, it, it was for, it was for literate people. It was for people who like to read. Kathy, I guess you know as well as I do that most people at one time or another have played those Space Invader type games on their computers. Mm -hmm. But have you ever thought of a game in which you sort of match wits with a computer, kind of a whodunit situation in which what you do dictates the outcome of a game. Sounds interesting. Yes. And what you're doing is allowing the person to essentially be Raymond Chandler and, and, pro that, and program their way through to the end, one that, way or the other. That's exactly right. In some ways it's like a book, in some ways it's like a game. We wrap ourselves in a game and become a participant.
type of story in which your decisions and your active participation affects the outcome. What will they think of next? This is the kind of thing that we're going to be playing with into the 21st century. Okay. Um, certainly, I think I speak for, you know, all of us when, you know, when I say that we definitely didn't uh, oh, uh, spent enough time kind of thinking about how lucky we were at that time. You know, we kind of assumed, oh, well, this is what it's always going to be like. This is going to go on forever, um, you know, much like youth itself. Um, you know, there wasn't much reflection on, oh, this is, you know, this is just a, you know, a, a shooting star, and in a, in a year and three years it'll all be gone. The thing that I was so taken by was this idea you were literally stepping into a world. It's as if the player and I are in a room together. It's me and him and it's what are you going to try and how am I going to respond. You can make a choice and your choices have ramifications and you think about that. I think as a kid, you don't get to make a lot of choices about your life. You, you know, you don't get to choose where you live, you don't get to choose where you go to school, you don't get to choose your classes even. Exploring, discovery, seeing what's around the next corner. For a kid, it's really appealing to be able to, you know, in this fantasy world, uh, essentially make your own choices in life. That level of dynamic interaction and that number of tree branches was unheard of. The idea of coming up with these huge worlds where there's so much that you can see and do. When I played Zork, I felt like I was in that world and the computer screen disappeared and it, it was it was like reading a book, only even cooler than reading a book in certain ways because I could do things in that world. It lets you see other people's points of view, I think. You get to see the worlds that other people live in. They had such a craft to them. They really sat down and did this. The way the game worked is it drew your mind into the game completely, but the flip side of that is it took an investment time on your part to get into the game because it wasn't just simple. I mean, you know, there were things that took 20 steps to solve a problem and you had to figure out every one of those 20 steps. It was all you thought about for a month, you know, while you were working on this thing. Or, you know, in some, in some cases it would take you like a year to finish one of these. It was really, it was this communal sense of, let's see if we can tackle this thing. And the puzzles were just so numerous and so massive, it, it almost felt like you needed to have someone helping. And when someone would have a big breakthrough, we'd go rushing down and say, oh, I think we have to do this. And, you know, it would work or not work. And the maps would come out and notes would get made. Uh, because the, you know, there wasn't the internet for the instant hints and, and all of that. And so you actually had to sit down and bash your head against it yourself. And Zork and the Radio Shack, you couldn't play alone because you had three guys on your shoulder. No, dude, you know, you, you, the, the full piece of plastic, you gotta, you know. So uh, solitary and it was, it was a team sport too. Although most people would not imagine that it could be. Saturdays at seven in the morning was when everybody came up to the college to watch this guy play adventure. So 
that was where I basically got my exposure was watching somebody else play it. I wasn't able to actually play it myself. So I, it was a long process. It wasn't kind of like a week's worth of gaming and we said, oh, that was kind of cool. I wonder what's next. I think most people who are working on the games thought that the most special thing about them was the obsessive nature of puzzle solving and how you could be, you know, playing the game and trying things and nothing's working and you're tearing your hair out and finally you like give up and you turn the computer off and you go stomping away and the next day you're at work and not even thinking about it and suddenly, oh my god. <laughs> And then you can't like wait to get home to like try what you just thought of, you know, and you go like running in and you turn on the computer and you try it and it worked! Yeah, it's almost what is, what is left unsaid, unrevealed. Uh, in a lot of cases. You don't know exactly what that dragon would look like, and I never would anyway, but to, you know, to have that gap where you fill in your conception of a dragon. It will be your ultimate dragon. I, you take stock of your possessions. You're wearing a pack. You have one sword mode. A financial nymph appears on your keyboard. By the way, you can check the amount of cash you're holding at any time with the cash command, or just type a dollar followed by return. Bye. She disappears with a link. It's like you would pretend you would have magic, right? But you don't know what it's really like. I mean, you don't really know what it's like to have magic. I mean, you can read a lot about what's, you can read science fiction and, and sort of put yourself in the place of a telepathic or magical character. But you really don't know what it's like. And, and I think that's sort of the same. It's like playing to be sighted. I'm playing at being sighted. And it's weird, it's, a, it's funny playing games, like, I actually have to, that actually does trip me out sometimes. I have to, you know, in games you have to have like a lantern or a flashlight or something to provide a source of light. Mm -hmm. I don't think about that. It's like, you go into him, it's like, it's pitch black, you can't see. And I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> you know, if, if you play something like Zork, everything is described. And sighted people don't always do that, so... You not only here get a sense of place and how places work and how you move through them, but you also get a sense of objects. You can examine, you know, every it's pretty much everything you can pick up in that game, and it'll have a description. So it, it's very helpful. The thing about text adventures is they really help you build mental maps, especially if you don't cheat and write anything down. And I know that the more I played text adventures, the more effective I was at navigating a strange place. That's it. There aren't limits. You can explore a world with all your senses. I think for the blind it's actually really liberating because you can explore a world with sight. For instance, Haunted Theater, uh, I played that in university and I never would have realized that so much you know, location was involved, so many different areas were involved in an old style movie theater. My last game I deliberately put in a section of the game that allows a blind player to play it. It's screen scraper friendly so that it would read out loud the game to them and allow them to play. And that was done because I was approached by blind players asking me to do that. That was a kind of a, an eye-opener for me to make me think about the necessity of doing that. Get lantern. You take the rest of your lantern off the sign. Let's, let's have a little thought experiment here. Right. You're playing in a virtual world, and it's got these pictures, and they're looking pretty good. And you think, oh, that's pretty good, you know, I, I like these pictures, and I make pretty well. You know, the, they're only, I mean, it's a 3D world, but I'm only seeing it in 2D on the screen, so maybe if I got, like, the little headset on and put that on, oh, now I can see it in 3D, uh, but if I move my head a bit too much, oh, well, maybe if you put little sensors on so I can move my head, ah, yeah, now I can see it properly, ah, yes, it's all here in, and, but, I can still only seeing things, and maybe I could have maybe some feeling as well. So I put a little day glove on, and uh, yes, oh, it feels warm. Oh, that's good. But I'm still, I'm not hearing things. Oh, I've got the goggles on, oh, um, and I haven't got this sense of, of being in a place. And maybe I want to be able to move. So I uh, tell you what, let's get these big like coffin things and fill them full of these gels, and I'll take off all my clothes and put on all these. Um, different devices and I lay down it and then it put little, these little electric currents through and make it feel hard or soft so it gives me the impression that I'm actually walking through grass because it's generating and now now I'm beginning to feel I'm really in one of these places but of course really what's all that's happening here is that um, 
and my, my, my senses are being fooled in, into this. What, what would happen if I was maybe to cut out the whole business with the fingers? Then you stick a little jack in the back of your head and it goes right into the spinal cord and then you're talking straight to the brain there. All the senses that come into your brain, they're all filtered and they're, and they're used to create a world model inside your head in your imagination. But if you could talk straight to that imagination and cut out all the senses, then you, it would be impossible to ignore it. You couldn't say, oh, that's just a, a, an image of a dragon. That would be a dragon. And if there was some kind of technology which could enable you to talk straight to the imagination, well, there is. It's called text. And it's been around for several thousand years. And I have seen people leap out of their chairs when a line is said in front of them, there is an immense fire-breathing dragon here. And when you're typing, the output that you're typing is in words, the same as the input. There's no shift. It's not that you're looking at a picture and then typing in words, looking at a picture moving around the mouse road. It's the same environment. It's all words, it's all thoughts, it's all the might, it's all the imagination. So when you're dealing with text, it's really for people who have got strong imaginations. And the tragedy is that many people have strong imaginations, it's just they never get to play the text because they went for the graphics first. Will we always have text? We will always have text. Will it always be inferior to graphics? Well, in terms of player numbers, yes. In terms of player experience, no. Because no matter how far you take graphics, eventually, the farthest you can get is text. Hmm. That's a ramp, ramp for you. Excellent. I was starting to map the game as well and write down everything that I'd done and I think again adventure games probably appeal to people who are very methodical and very logical in, in the way they do things because mapping is a huge part of playing any adventure, text adventure. It's very rarely that I find myself playing a game of IF without taking notes. You couldn't hold the map in your head. You had to map it out. There's lots and lots of objects. You had to make notes of where everything was and what it was used for and what you hadn't figured out yet. Personally, I like taking notes. I like um, having my own little, you know, notch on the bedpost, as it were, that I've figured this out. Uh, of, of it's sort of like my own little personal progress bar as to what I've been able to accomplish in these games. Like Colossal Cave was relatively straightforward and that if you left a room from the north you would then exit that room again to the south and you'd wind up where you started. But Zork had these passages that apparently went out of the room to the north and then you twisted and turned and spun and such that it going south again might get you to an entirely different room. Uh, mapping Zork was, was quite time consuming and, and we were working on a like, huge uh, line printer paper from the original 14 inches wide, 15 inches wide um, that comes off those high speed line printers and uh, even that we had several sheets taped together by the time we were done. I mean it was, it was a big complex environment that they put together. I can draw a map that not only tells me how things are connected in space but also where objects were that I have picked up. You can note on the map where you got them, you can note uh, where it seems like there's uh, uh, some obstacle and you can start thinking about puzzles as well. This parallels exactly the, the mapping of a large cave system. And it's only when you do that that you begin to comprehend what the pattern is. In caving, you, you try to find the pattern. Once you know the pattern, you know the process that created the cave and you can see the missing parts of the pattern. I mean, mazes are sort of a special case in IF. Like, people have a pathological aversion to mazes, which is, you know, like you, I don't know, you, you like ring a bell and then like you kick a dog a bunch of times and like it starts like crying after you ring the bell a couple times. So that's how people in the IF community feel about mazes. Oh my God, a maze, kill me now. 
and there's there's nothing there's nothing intrinsically wrong about mazes, but people have like a built-in aversion to them by now. So that's that, that's kind of a special case. I, I thought mazes were old school from the beginning myself. Mazes were a staple of early interactive fiction. It seemed as though virtually every story had at least one or two mazes that you had to somehow map your way around in and figure your way out of. The ultimate adventure game cliche is a maze. So. They were, there was always, oh my, you know, another maze, oh please, or, you know, th this one is too ridiculous. When you're encountering something for the first time, it seems really cool. Um, when I played Zork, I was like, oh, this maze, what a brilliant idea. Um, and then 50,000 iterations later, it just does not seem so brilliant. IF is actually pretty crummy at literal spatial mazes. 3D graphics do that much better. You can create enormous, immersive, expansive environments that are highly confusing that you wander around in and you do all your wandering visually and physically. Uh, typing go north, go east, go south, go east, go north, go east. Um, at a certain point you start to long for a joystick. The worst thing you can ask a player to do is sit down with a pad of paper dropping items in each room so they can keep track of what these different rooms are and then be able to put all the little lines together. Essentially it just becomes tedium and it takes you out of that immersion into the world. My goal whenever I wrote a game that had a maze in it was to produce a maze that if you got the trick became trivial. There may be limits to what mazes can do. I don't think they can. Um, impress on us, you know, uh, powerful new ideas about the world. Old style mazes in 3D games and console games and in, in IF always will work to burn more hours and create more kind of consumable playtime. But if you're not understanding the way the author is thinking and having insights, what's the point? The first time that we went to the Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago, I was finishing work on Sea Stalker and working in our booth on the floor, uh, got a chance to give a short demo for a group of school teachers who were there. And after just the shortest demo I've ever given, they said, oh, this is wonderful. This is just what our students need. It's on their level. They'll be interested. They'll learn from it. And I felt really good about that. Uh, I started teaching in 1968. This last year is my 38th year. Teaching with interactive fiction poses some real, really significant challenges for teachers. It's not an easy technique. It's a wonderfully powerful technique. It's great for helping kids to solve problems. Outstanding for improving kids' reading comprehension unique in its power to help kids read with greater fluency. Writing for Interactive Environments is a class looking at the traditional story structure and then discussing also how it takes place in games, um, drawing analogies to film and other popular media. I give them two weeks. At the start of the two weeks they've never before seen a piece of interactive fiction. They maybe have never played a text adventure and they've certainly never programmed um, in form and at the end they have to turn something in. So that's the experience. So our, our first things we do in that class is we work on um, what are good characters and then what are good settings for stories and how those interact with one another. And then we talk about things like puzzle structures. Um, what's a good puzzle? What's a good riddle? In my case, when I'm using IF in teaching, it's not really for the IF. It's not for the interactive fiction at all. It's in it's many ways for the idea of simulating space um, and also just to give my students some weird environment that they've never worked in. Uh, usually they become very interested very quickly and will ask to try some more of that story uh, the next day or very soon thereafter. Write a character but write him four different ways. Show me him from the perspective of his father. Show me him from the perspective of his friend who hates him now because they had an altercation in the past. I mean, this is the only form of literature that has built into it aesthetically designed pauses in the process of reading that are 
that are perfect from a teacher's point of view. You know, among my students who like interactive fiction the least, a certain number complained that it made them think too hard. And um, I really don't mind if people claim that I make them think. Which is something, of course, most people never do in their adult lifetimes. They actually learn a new form of literature. And uh, it, uh, along with many of the other challenges that go with teaching in the current era, um, it, uh, you know, it makes it difficult for, uh, for teachers to work, even if they have one another to support. <laughs> for them, the real challenge is getting them to actually sit down and read a serial, linear, closed narrative. Um, for them, reading is a chore. It's, and that, I find that, it's funny, I, I find myself both ways. I'm like, that's heartbreaking that they think that reading is a, a dead thing. Um, but at the same time, they're writing for a world where they're going to have to craft these broken up, chopped up, sliced and diced narratives for um, different mediums, and they're going to have to learn to adapt. Broken up, chopped up, sliced and diced narratives, chopped up, broken up, and they're going to have to learn to adapt. My doctorate is uh, officially in English literature. My field is new media. No discipline has been extremely excited about owning text adventure games. <laughs> They've uh, found academic safe harbor in whatever individual was most passionate about them. But I mean, of course, uh, Marianne Buckle's uh, doctrine in German literature, right? I think that topic, unfortunately, chose me. They were just so happy. It looked like they were having a great time. That's what I remember of the first, my first contact with adventure, that, oh, these people love this. They are totally involved in it. If you stood at the beginning of films, if you stood at the beginning of radio, if you stood at that moment and you knew this is important. This isn't just something to toss aside. This is really, really important. Could you go back and write about Georg Trakl and his, and his poetry about purple beasts? I mean, it's beautiful poetry, and I loved, I loved that poetry. But that's unimportant. But, and this topic was important. Someday, there is going to be a genius, an absolute genius, who writes something so brilliant, so involving, so magnificent, that you'll just weep for joy doing these games because they make you involved in the story. That's just so different than, than anything else that we've ever had. I don't know if... Um my fate will be to be left in uh, some sort of academic dustbin of history or if uh, this will be a brilliant coup that will become the cornerstone of a, of a luminous career. But I do know that it was time well spent and that when I look at what I've done, I think even if not me, I hope somebody comes along and builds on this. They were having so much, it was a moment when people were having so much fun. <laughs> it was a ball. That was really fun. That was really, and I thought, oh, if everybody were doing this, all of society would be better because we'd all be happier. We'd all play with each other a little bit more. It'd be, you know, like being kids again. It didn't turn out. Now, did you actually solve adventure? No, I never did. I never did. <laughs> I never did. You know, when we were making them initially, we often talked about the fact that this, this is a genre that could last for centuries. You know, we looked at, you know, we would compare it to the book say well you know yes technology has changed and there you know phonographs came along and radios and televisions and all these other technologies but 
you know the book is still the book and it still sells just because other kinds of games are possible or fancy graphics are possible or whatever doesn't mean that there's no room for a text adventure so we were fairly convinced that that is that was a genre that could continue you know I, I honestly I think we might have been kidding ourselves in terms of it being you know big enough to sustain you know a company but obviously it's continued in terms of hobbyists doing it It started on a group of Usenet news groups, Rec Arts in Fiction and Rec Games in Fiction, that were uh, originally talking about hypertext and things like that, but slowly discussion of Infocom games came to dominate it in the early 90s. I rediscovered interactive fiction through uh, the online communities uh, that had been around for quite a while. And so there was this nucleus of people who were interested in interactive fiction and talking about it and doing reverse engineering of Infocom's story format and all that kind of thing. Everything was tied in and as soon as you find the outer edge of the web everything funnels in towards the center and you find this interconnected group of people. You had some more artistic types who were interested in the medium and the academics who later were studying it as an art form and so all of these people sort of accumulated around this news group. It kind of blows my mind that we have this group of people that is willing to put in all of this work um, for free, knowing that they'll never be compensated in any way besides people's attention and praise. And they're creating these amazing pieces of work. We're talking about a, a community that has been around, you know, we're coming up really on 20 years worth of community if you go back to the, the early internet days. I've been following the amateur uh, scene fairly closely over the decades and you know they've got all the basics down there's some really really talented people any one of them could have succeeded at Infocom uh, as well as any of us I think there's some really bright people out there doing these things I guess my reaction was um, that you know that I thought this was very nice that the that the genre even though it had died as a commercial medium you know, was, was continuing to live on as an artistic medium and feeling, you know, almost, almost a sense of relief that, um, you know, that it, it would continue to live on in this new form. In 98, as early as 98, when I was working on Spider and Web, I was thinking, I, it would be awfully nice if I could publish a game and get money for it. There's a lot of people that would like to see um, IF go commercial. The question of a company publishing IF into the greater market, man, I hope that works. Now, a lot of people, some people, think that there is some way to, to crack the market and, and, and sell these games to people who would be, instead of reading books, they'll, they'll play interactive fiction games. It's fun to go make physical uh, manifestations of your game. It's nice to have something up on the mantle you can look at and say, yeah, you know what, I did that. It's not just a bunch of code on the computer. This is something that I can, I can, I can put in my hands. Yeah, now the piece that I didn't really take into account is that I'm a horrible salesman, right? Are sales good? Uh, we... <laughs> the, the type of person that spends four years coding a computer game is probably maybe usually not the same type of person that can go out and sell that game very effectively, so... Sales are alright. Um, considering that we dumped it on the internet for free, I was actually really happy with it. I, w I made 50 copies of Necrotic Drift. We were able to sell them all through the website. I, I think I threw the last few on eBay. Although it's really only been available in maybe a dozen shops, those shops continue to sell it uh, even it's been three years now um, since I first started selling it and they they still sell light bulb bing let's let's make brand new games in the Infocom tradition and sell them to people who want them and Valencia was born the the way to get interactive fiction out to um, more people beyond our community and other communities is marketing the perception is, from a lot of people's point of view, is what is it? And I think I've spent more time and resources trying to write uh, marketing um, facts, 
What is it? What is it? How do you? What is it? It's going to require uh, a serious effort to market the product to audiences in a way where that audience is going to say, "Yeah, I really want to play that." If I'm going to walk over to a kid who's playing Halo 2 on his Xbox 360 and say, "Hey, kid, want to try a new game? Sure. What do you got? Pentar the Apprentice. What's it about? Well, this is a young wizard in a, in a wizard's guild, and he's..." You know, his master is captured during his final exams to become a true sorcerer, and you have to go rescue him, and then you have to go to this evil dark city of mages and conquer an evil queen. Sounds great, let me have tried it. And they sit down at the keyboard and, hey, did it crash? The game is moderated by a computer, and we're, there's not as much throwing of dice and, <laughs> and statistics and, and so forth. Uh, and that's, that seems, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how successful that explanation is. <laughs> As currently conceived, it's just not marketable under a games industry idea of what you're buying. Because the games industry idea would always say, you're going to have to add more mazes or you're going to have to add unlockable cards that you find and there are going to have to be 50 of them so that we can layer enough extra stuff on there to keep the interactor busy for an extra 12 hours. Otherwise, they're going to feel cheated when they're done. We'd, we'd go to, we went to a couple of computer game conferences, you know, we'd, we'd talk to people and we'd tell them a little bit about what we were doing. And everyone we'd talk to, you know, they'd, we'd, we'd get these kind of stunned blank stares. They'd say, text adventures? What, what does that have to do with commercial games anymore? That was years ago. <laughs> I had great hopes for the Michael Berwin Cascade Mountain attempt. That was, what, 99? Uh, I wish that had worked. That didn't work at all. I would say that the commercial market for interactive fiction is so small that it doesn't warrant an investment of any financial magnitude at all. I think if you want to do it as a home hobbyist or you want to do it as an artist or you want to do it to prove a point or you want to do it to amuse your friends and relatives, that's great, but don't ask me to invest any money in it, because I did that, and it was a total abject failure. I guess since the first couple of horribly failed attempts, my opinion has been, you know, prove that you have a working company and you're actually going to make some kind of a profit, and I will write you games from now until the cows come home. I would love to switch into doing that full time. Clearly, if you're going to make something, you have to make sure that there are enough people who are going to buy it to justify your investment. And uh, we didn't do that well enough, or at all. So I don't believe there's a market. But does that stop me? Pretty much. I'm not desperate to find um, new commercial opportunities for IF. That's. Um, that's an understatement. I'm, I'm not, you know, really, really interested in um, what the marketplace can do for IF myself. Um, but I think there's advantages to the forum having been through this commercial phase. There's things uh, that can be learned from what businesses did. And I find it hard to believe that text adventures are going to sell the kids. But you know, like if someone wants to do it and they they succeed, good luck to them. I'm playing in multiplayer online games, um, which was, again, this was something I didn't do until a few years ago when I said some friends and I were considering starting one up, and I didn't actually have any experience with multiplayer online games, and so, well, I decided to start playing one just to find out what they were like, because if I might be trying to design one, it would be useful to know what there is. Do you have a preference? I mean, is there one you prefer to use? Um, I mostly play EverQuest. You know, because I'd been away from it for, you know, for so many years, I, I really didn't know until a few years ago how much of this was still around. Uh, I think it was just maybe at a trade show or something, and someone whipped out a, an early PDA, you know, and said, look at this, and then it was running Planetfall or Hitchhiker's Guide or something. Pretty dumbfounded, actually. Well, the biggest confusion I get nowadays is, you write Dilbert, don't you? <laughs> now, that's a different Scott Adams. I think it's great. I mean, you know, I... Uh, I'm certainly not losing any royalty on it. I didn't have a royalty interest in any of the games. I was just, uh, you know, on, on straight salary for Infocom. 
Um, so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the, the more people who can play those games, the better. We're starting to get into that stage where there are now people who, you know, are in the computer industry and haven't heard of adventure, let alone had it been the seminal point of their career. <laughs> uh, Scott was uh, putting out uh, a, a newsletter, and in it he said, there's another Scott Adams out there that wrote adventure games way back in the dawn of history, and if anybody knows him, please let me know, because I'm getting a bunch of his mail. <laughs> and he was getting my fan mail. I still get his fan mail, so... Do you have much case where you're playing EverQuest and someone figures out they're playing against the guy who invented the genre? No, it hasn't come up. Um, it'll be interesting when we finish up here. Um, as I, say, I have a, my, my guild has a raid at six o'clock, and um, I, I, I intend to just sort of mention at some point that you know what I spent my afternoon doing and see whether it leads to any conversation. I'm not one for click and watch them games. I can't get on with them. I think it's best up here. It's the best computer you can get. It's your brain. You know, I think people's minds have changed over 27 years, and we may not be satisfied anymore with text and get knife and kill troll. Um, but when you play it, to me anyway, it's still as mentally engrossing as it ever was. When you're reading the prose, it's like you hear it in your head and you're forming your own picture of it. A picture which is a personal thing to you and not, uh, not someone, art director's idea of what Gollum looks like or what he sounds like. People would much rather look at pictures than read as a rule. There's, you know, sort of a, there's a subculture of people who love to read and are passionate about reading and passionate about books, but it's not a majority of the, the public. Text is lost because people just expect computer games to have graphics and if you want them to play a game that doesn't have graphics then you have to give them a very good reason not to. What the greatest of literature, the greatest of art does is that it resonates back to yourself and you know a side-scrolling shooter where you're just endlessly blowing up identical spacecraft is not going to do that. I sense that I'm not the only person starting to go oh, oh, oh. I feel very bored at um, spectacular uh, computer graphics. But Text Adventures gave us the possibility that a story could have meaningful consequences uh, both internally and for the reader, for the player, uh, in a way that had never been seen before. There's something that needs to be refound. We've lost something and we need to find it again. The prevailing opinion is no one will go to their computer and sit there and read to play something. They want to see the visuals. They want to play with the Xbox or something like that. But in fact, what's happened since then? Now, we all have the internet. And we, what do people do with computers most of the time that they're sitting on the computer? They're on the internet and they're reading and they read a page and then they type something in. Maybe they type a new address and they go to that next address. They click on the next thing to go to the next page. And we read for hours and hours on our computers now. And they didn't believe that we would do that anymore. Now we're back to it. We're all reading on computers. I, I don't think that there, if, if we just put it out there and say, here's a text game, and we'll put it in bookshops and put it in computer stores, I think it's an easy sell. There is a machine that you must operate, but what's the key and what's a lock? What should I be doing to unlock it? Start the machine and what will it do? That's a, that's a puzzle that I think has the potential to never grow old. There's still a lot left to do.
No, 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 no. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Yep, perfect. Sorry, I had the microphone muted so I wouldn't simply blast over with my own commentary on my own movie. Okay. Okay. Sound? Okay, sound? Okay. Hello. Hello, yes, there you are. Yes. Okay. Good, good, good. So... Unless there are, maybe there are already questions from the audience. Are there any? Yes. Okay, there are a couple of questions from the audience. So, okay, please. Uh, not related to the movie, but um, uh, I'm a guy who already interviewed James Scott Bunch in 2008. And in 2008, he said to us that he didn't want to make this job to his primary job. And to me, that was, oh, there's, there's a mic. Oh, that's great. I don't know if Jason can hear me now. Okay, I'm Jason sure. cannot hear you. I have okay. to. Okay, okay, I just. Okay, but okay, let's Should I repeat it? it? Let, let, let's do it that way. If anyone wants to uh, ask a question, please come here to me and okay. like speak into my, uh, or, or actually Jens' computer. Okay. And I, actually, I think that's the best way why then not? I don't have to repeat all the questions and then stuff. I can. And I, agree, I agree because because you'll just add crazy shit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we want to avoid crazy shit. So. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Uh, hey Jason, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. Um, I'm Sebastian from Adventure Draft. Uh, we okay. already interviewed you once, I think, two years ago. Yes. Uh, and one question uh, is that uh, you said in our interview that you didn't want to make this documentary job your primary job because you didn't want it to be dependent on financing and on, and on deadlines and yeah. uh, now you but now you do is do this as your primary job at the moment so my yeah. question uh, would be was there any special event that may change your mind there were two things first of all my main job became awful um, I had been uh, I had been a system administrator for a customer for about 10 years, and it had been really a nice job. And that customer moved away because they're slowly dying, and they, the company assigned me to a new customer who was awful. I mean, awful. I did a 48-hour support call, things like that, where I was on the phone for 48 straight hours. And they, would, they were a company who 
from their early days was built on screaming and misery. This is well known. And I had not prepared for that. And so I was like, okay, if this is the way things are now, goodbye. And I really didn't want to go back into that. So I said, okay, let me make a go at, at least taking time off. So that's why I'm, you know, that's that. And the other one was, of course, that um, I thought that maybe I could do the movie um, thing while having a primary job with history, speaking, academics. But the academic world, at least in America, moves rather glacially towards bringing you in. So while I had some lines in on maybe becoming an archivist or a teacher or something, it just takes months. But, you know, so that, that, that was mostly what changed. Um, okay. So I'd be at a regular job, you know, by next year again. But for the moment, that's my thought. Uh, and so just one more, uh, probably more uh, personal question. I hope the audience uh, bears with me. Uh, I realized that you made a video uh, with MC Front a lot, uh, yes. which is called, um, which is actually is about the Sorg. Uh, it's pitch, pitch Dark, I think. Yes. Um, how did this came uh, together? So how, how, did, how, did, how was this realized? And the second question would be, will this also be on the DVD? Well, it'll, it'll most certainly be on the DVD. Um, the, the way that it came about was that I had kind of known of MC Front a lot through a number of people, and I said I made a deal with him, which was I'll make a music video for you for free if you write a song about text adventures. And so he said, okay. And since then, we've become buddies. We've done a lot of work with each other, and uh, I have another video that I have to finish with him that has Jonathan Colton in it, and so on. So it kind of became this kind of like, oh, well, I'll do a video with you, and you don't have to pay, and I'll do, and I'll get your song. And it was a really good song, that enough that he still plays it in concerts, and people sing along, and I'm like, oh, God, glad I was a part of that. So that's where that came from. Okay. So thanks a lot, and uh, probably if you have some more time, probably we can make uh, another interview on our website when the DVD comes out. I hope it was worth the miles for you. It definitely was, I think. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And greet greetings to your cat. <laughs> I think that your cat doesn't need any more greetings. Oh, you know my cat doesn't need anything at uh, this point. Yeah. <laughs> okay, if you don't know, his cat has more than one million followers on Twitter. So, okay. Uh, good, Jens. Yes. Um, I don't know uh, really how to, to address this point, but uh, I guess I'm just going to be the Eurocentric party pooper. I understand that um, putting you know, uh, interactive fiction or text adventures in other languages would be like covering the niche of the niche, but um, still a lot of your documentary was very American. And, Absolutely. Uh, and um, I was uh, missing especially uh, British contributions to, to the genre of English-speaking text adventures. Mm -hmm. So um, I didn't see anything from Magnetic Scrolls there. Um, the, uh, I didn't see anything about uh, the development of Inform, the compiler. So um, any chance that we get to see something like that? Uh, I, there, there is a feature. There's a bonus feature of Richard Hewison, who's the English gentleman who says mapping was very important, uh, talking about the history of magnetic scrolls. Um, I started to look, what, what I've discovered is that I, it really tests the limits for me to try to really properly tell the story of scenes that I had no, um, I can't speak the language of. I can't do the interview, right? I have to do it through a, uh, an interpreter. Um, I knew that this thing was going to be vaguely um, North American-centric. Um, it just is. It's one of these things where I'm like, okay, and then I'm going to release you know, the full interviews of Richard Bartle and Richard Hewison and Frank Frid, who's the other guy you see uh, for a moment. Um, and you'll also notice, though, that like... The documentary is more about text adventuring than about specific games. 
Infocom dominates mostly because I had so many Infocom people. But the story that I tell is trying to just show that these games existed and kind of what goes around there. But there will always be missing things. For instance, I really give short shrift to Sierra Online. Um, as for Inform, um, is this being recorded? Um, uh, I think yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. being recorded. Okay. Graham Nelson is very difficult to deal with. <laughs> Let's put it that way. How about that? How that about sounds, I have never That's a very American way to say that. Very yes. friendly. He's rather difficult to deal with. And so when you have to, Okay. There are very few people in the world that I think really earn the situation that you get told that something can't be done by the implication of people who have mailed him for you that they've had no response after a few months on that subject after they've mailed him. That's reserved for a very short number of people, except for Graham Nelson. And so I really tried to put in something about Inform and have him speak about why he cares so much about it that he continues to work on it. But he severely blew me off. Um, Will Crowther has blown people off since 1982. Um, but at least I got a no. <laughs> I got a no that was whatever. I discovered the real way to, to get him to talk about adventure is you interview him about his work on the internet because he was one of the designers of the ARPANET and then kind of leak over into adventure and he'll speak about it. But I thought that was really crappy and I decided not to do that. Um, so anyway, um, I, I, will f I think you'll find with this that there are subjects, oh, leaving out the fact that you're seeing one third of the movie here um, and you're not seeing the 27 or 30, I think it is, bonus features, some of which are 12 minutes long about things as specific as every aspect of Mind Forever Voyaging, how the Z machine worked, and so on. Okay. Um, okay. There will always be parts that just people go, Maybe. why didn't he cover this? And the answer is, after four years, that's where the chips fell. Maybe, um, if I may add something, um, one, one of part course. of the movie that I found absolutely touching and um, also well, yeah, showed uh, a different perspective for me was uh, with the blind interactive fact, uh, fiction players. Um, I don't think it's really fair to compare that, but um, in, in a sense it is, because the writers, uh, the authors and programmers of this work probably didn't imagine where their uh, work would end up. And, um, yeah, um, Luckily enough, I'm not blind, but I do remember that a lot of my English vocabulary actually comes from interactive fiction. So mm. I was uh, like 12 years old, um, and I think this is a, is a common uh, experience that many in this room probably had uh, growing up in Germany or so. Um, I was 12 years old, I had my dictionary next to me, I was playing interactive fiction in this foreign language, and I wouldn't know what to lever a boulder would mean, uh, because we wouldn't have that vocabulary in our uh, mm. school lesson. Um, so yeah, um, I, I really like that um, thing about the reader, almost in a Foucault sense of, of thing, doing something with the work that um, wasn't expected by the author. Yes. And, uh, and you had that covered with the blind players, but also um, English interactive fiction um, as uh, for learning a foreign language uh, played a big role. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's actually, it's it's interesting. There's two things. First of all, in the final, in the revised cut of this, uh, Steve looking at you sadly is reduced. I again heard the giggling. It's just I didn't have a chance to give you, you know, to re-render properly. Uh, that's the one shot where I'm like, oh, that just goes on too long. Um, so I know that, but I have gotten feedback from a number of people that they were really surprised by the prominence of blind, of blind players and what they think of it. And I had always thought that was a basic aspect of it. I'm making, after I finish this and the DVD goes out, I'm making 
blind accessible versions of this uh, for my blind interviewees, among others. But you know, basically, I figured out that you can't really easily make a blind accessible DVD that also works for sighted people, if for no other reason than the film is cut a certain way, and I would want to recut an audio stream so that it was more descriptive in between things and stretch things out. So, you know, that's the plan. Um, and so, I was really, I I was really appreciative. Um, and like, yeah, anyway, so yes, that, that was one of those things where I think people, I didn't know at the time that people were going to be so touched by the blind players, and um, I think that they are almost critical <laughs> to the story. Uh, okay, so, uh, okay, there we have one more question. Yep. Hi, I'm Magdalena. Hello. Hello. Um, so I know I am your intro history, but uh, I'd like to ask a question about the uh, uh, present or maybe future. Uh, maybe you have seen uh, recently a video uh, showing an uh, iPad game or, or a book, Alice in Wonderland, with animated illustrations. You can tilt the iPad yes. or, or shake it and the animations would move. And I thought, hey, that's cool. And it's when you make these interactive and the, uh, the reader of the book could explore maybe an adjacent storyline um, with mm -hmm. yeah, interactive elements, then you're back to text adventures, basically. Um, yes. Have you uh, seen more examples in this direction, or can you, can you see um, something going there? I think that you're going to see, well, first of all, um, I mean, one of, the, one of the things is that there's been more, many more games made since the commercial industry came to a close since then. And a lot of people have made a lot of games and a lot of different goals. And um, there's like a whole group that are working so hard to kind of make interactive fiction function as a, um, um, like a, a, in modern terms and expectations of people. And I think the iPad is going to make a lot of waves on that. I mean, we got a million of them now, right? So people are more likely to go, okay, and, and they've been building these tools for years and years. So and I, I've got no fear. In, in your interview said how difficult it was to market later, the text adventures when the graphics came along, but then you got the App Store and whatever, so maybe easier right. for, the, for the strange weird guys just writing. I mean, picture. nobody would have thought that you can actually make money with iFart. I mean... Right. <laughs> new markets. Well, well, that's the thing, right? You got things like Farmville, and I can't believe somebody lives off that. Uh, but, you know, then we found out <laughs> yeah. terrible things about humanity. <laughs> okay, so, more questions? Okay, so, yeah, of course, come here. I hope you enjoy your motel in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I, oh, it's just wonderful. It reminds me of Germany. How's that? <laughs> I don't know. If I could start drinking. Uh, hi, I'm Jan. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, you mentioned it before, but I think it was kind of sad that Will Crowther wasn't in the movie. Uh, Agreed. Did you say something, or can you say something about why he uh, doesn't want uh, to talk about this? I've talked to a number of, okay. <laughs> I've talked to people who know him. I've talked to people who uh, have dealt with him in the modern era. I even had Don Woods kind of communicate with him, like, maybe you want to do this. I had a couple people on the Infocom side who I was told would never sit for an interview, people like Mark Blank. And what they, Mark Blank said to me, well, I think you're it. Like, I think you're the documentary on this, and I don't think I'm going to have to do this again, so yay. Scott Adams wanted nothing to do with it beyond, let's just do this interview because I know I'm required. You know, for a lot of them, they're like, yeah, that was like high school, but I don't want to talk about high school anymore. And Willie Crowther made this game for his daughters because his wife had fallen in love with another caver and left him, and they'd gotten divorced. And while trying to reconnect with his daughters, he made this little dumb game in about two months uh, and showed people it and kind of used the cave he had been part of. But then he, he never went back to the caving community again. And for him, it's this painful little thing that he put together as a desperate divorcee in the 1970s. And then there's assholes like me in the 21st century, like, let's talk about that. And, 
he just doesn't want to talk about it. It's just one of those things that's just kind of in his past. He doesn't want to kind of go, wow, it's starting to really get bright in here. Jesus. Um, he, uh, he just doesn't want to be a part of that. And I talked to somebody who interviewed him in 1982, and even then he was like, you know, I worked really hard on the ARPANET. Like, he designed part of the packet switching network that we all use today. And people were like, yeah, that's cute, but what about adventure? What about this little dumb eventually, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, I don't know, imagine that you like made a beautiful car and, and you changed the world and everything, but people go, you know, back in college, you programmed a screensaver that everyone still uses. What do you think about that? And be like, uh, so that's part of it. And yeah, I could have ambushed him. I knew, I know where he lives. And I don't <laughs> work, you know, I'm, I'm just not going to do that. So no kind of Michael Moore. Uh appearance at his house yeah yeah you know you know you know i don't think what really adds to the grandeur of a historical documentary is a shaky cam shot of a person running to their car while i scream questions <laughs> <laughs> i don't think that really really gives respect to the person <laughs> you made adventure one day <laughs> so no okay thank you very much okay uh I would actually have a question. There was a certain time in the adventure, uh, in, in, in the history of text adventures, when they, I don't know when it started, but they tried to incorporate graphics into text adventures. Hey, I, I, I know you. <laughs> hey. <laughs> okay, so for a certain time, for a certain time, they, 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 they put graphics into text adventures. Yes. Um, and. Was this like uh, almost like the decline of text adventures when they tried to like it, was it like an act of desperation or did they try to make the best out of their their, uh, their computer possibilities back? Yeah. There's a sequence in 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 the DVD. I'm not sure if it's a bonus feature or if it's part of one of the other runs, right? I mean, and the thing, like I said, I have to understand is that you've just seen one third of it. For instance, there's an entire meditation on the fact that when people would use text adventures and they weren't schooled in how you'd play them, that they were miserable. You know, like you'd show up and you'd be at a game and you'd write, take over kingdom, right? When the, the goal was to win by taking over the kingdom, it would go, what? Um, well, similarly, I have a whole thing on graphics. And one of the things is Infocom was definitely moving into graphics. And part of what killed them was that they didn't move fast enough into graphics. Sierra Online moved into graphics almost immediately. They only made one or two games that weren't. And so I don't know if it killed it in terms of um, the genre going on to live. Um, certainly up until the early 1990s, people made games like that. But I think what happened was, was that games started to move. You know this whole bullshit about AAA titles? Have you heard that term, AAA titles? It's one of the things that's really destroyed the games industry in terms of thinking of games as being just things, which is why I'm kind of excited about this, what they're now calling the independent games um, movement, IGF and so on, is that what happened is, is that the companies that would hire somebody to work for a year or a half year on a text adventure started dumping all their money into making graphic games that required 100 people and would take, you know, two years to make and spend millions of dollars. And so it just, you could not compete. Um, it, it's where the money went. And so you stopped doing it. And what happened is, is that um, um, it just like text adventures kind of just disappeared along with a lot of other types of games, actually, you know, other little things. We ended up going into like, everybody made a fighting game. Everyone made a first person shooter. And they couldn't be bothered to try to make anything else, right? So I think that's a lot of what it was. You know, like right now we have this whole thing with, uh, you know, sandbox games, right? And a sandbox game is a terrible time sink. Um, you know, you're requiring hundreds of people. You've got divisions in other locations where people do nothing but try to recreate a city block by block for six months, 12-hour days, right? There's no place for a thoughtful game in that. Um, now that we have this whole independent games movement, we're starting to see text adventures show up again. And we're starting to see people kind of bring them back. That was a very long answer. It was, yeah. I'm just, I'm just thinking of it's, it, it might be a quite of a stretch of, uh, of a statement now. But I know that you have a very special um, connection to Wikipedia. 
Yes. We actually hate it, I guess. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I, t today I told that um, in, in another, another like, uh, uh, when, when I was interviewed, I was pretty much saying that, uh, that Wikipedia is probably the biggest text-based game on the planet. Yes, I've said that before too, it's, and I agree. It's like uh, it's like a, a massive multiplayer text game. Okay. Oh yeah, no, those those NPCs are assholes. I mean, you, they just they just they just jump on you, but uh, you know, you think that you're trying to do something, and suddenly you're attacked on all sides, and it takes all your effort to try to succeed. No, it's definitely a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What what I mean is like at the moment, like defining what is interactive fiction and what is text adventure kind of thing. That might be part of the problem why everyone is thinking of, hey, there's this old concept of what a text adventure is. Uh, and we try to recreate that or sell that or whatever. Uh, but I mean, there are so many different ways to see like playing with text and Wikipedia could be one such a thing of like considering how you can play to text. Yeah. I can see that. I, I you know, I, I, um, I uh, it's funny, you know, you do a documentary on a relatively obscure subject like this. It's, what I'm happy about is it's a subject that's both obscure and not obscure, right? A lot of people know it, but a lot of people are surprised there's a documentary about it. And it's got advantages and disadvantages to the fact that I did this, right? I mean, the reason that there's this one hour cut is because I think for some people, that's about the limit of what they need. I mean, I'm sure some of the people in this room have gone, all right, I got it, all set. And other people are going, no, I want to know more. Did he go into this? And he doesn't want to, you know, and so on. And I just think that's the, the nature of it. And one of those is text adventures as a subject. There's still a lot of cultural interest in them. I think that people are still doing exciting things with them. I think stuff is going on. The primary reason I did this documentary, though, was I was worried that you would, like software is the bones, right? You can always download the software, but to get the meat, to understand why the software was created and what the thinking was and why people like them or don't like them, I wanted to do interviews and documentary work. That's the, that's the principle. But when I find myself thrust into this weird thing of like advocate for the genre, I do okay, but I'm not as good as some of the people out there. I, I'm hoping to really buff out the links on gitlamp.com so that people can kind of go and see what the real ad, I mean, there's a, there's a woman named Emily Short who didn't want to be interviewed for the documentary, and she sort of regrets that, and um, she does enormous amounts of work. She does huge essays and writings and reviews and tries to improve everything, and, and she's doing work in the, in the genre. I was just doing work trying to assemble, um, you know, 120 hours of footage into something cohesive. Okay. So I guess uh, we are shortly over like, uh, like 11 p.m. now. I think we should probably stop now. It was great having you here. Uh, it's too bad that you're not in Germany, but you're in Pennsylvania, and the best crazy Germans are actually in Pennsylvania. They are called Amish. So yes. check them out. Uh, and a big applause for uh, Jason Scott, and great work. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Good night, good afternoon. Good night. <laughs>